and then for the presenters, I'll be keeping my eyes out um, for hands raised so that if I accident you don't get a chance to see everyone on the screen, I'll let you know, oh, so-and-so is raising their hand. Um, next up, guys, let's review just some ways that we can start sentence starters. I need a volunteer to read for us these question starters. So we don't have any mm. calls, like ever. Valerie. We also have that art college. Who's calling us? Uh, it's the art people at Durham Arts Council. What? Can you see Valerie? Mm -hmm. Ashley, would you read these for us? Starting with Did You Ever? Did you ever? What was your favorite? What? What's your least favorite? Can you tell me about a time when? Where did you want to work before you got your um, correct job? Current, yes. Current means the job you have right now. So those are just some examples of ways you can start a question. Did you ever, what was your favorite, or what was your least favorite? All right, one more quick thing is that I noticed that you guys have been working very hard at home, learning about the careers of your choice. Some of you are learning about starting a pizza shop or being a geneticist or a firefighter. So I had asked Hadley if she was okay with me sharing with you guys the work that she's done um, about what it is that firefighters do. So I will share what Hadley sent me, and then she can actually read her paragraph for you. Um, Hadley, can you see the picture on the screen right now? Yeah. Alrighty. So everyone can see her brain map and then her paragraph. Would you like to read your paragraph for us? Sure. Firefighters work very hard to protect people from fires. They hang out at a fire at fire stations until they get a call telling them where a fire is. Their job is to go into fires at temperatures of 1,500 degrees. Did you know that 75% of firefighters are actually volunteers and that they're expected to get dressed in less than two minutes? I think fire, that firefighters have very cool and daring jobs. My uncle is a firefighter. Good job, Hadley. I loved reading that, and I really liked your brain map, too, with the different colors and everything. So we are just about ready to have our presenters begin, and I'll show you our schedule. So let me offer that Dashiell and your mom can unmute yourself, and so can Andrew and your mom, and so can Rosie and your mom, since these are my three presenters. And can you guys see our schedule on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So we already did number one. And Mrs. Cohen will be first, then Mrs. Todd, and then Mrs. Edmonds. Um, and after Edmonds goes, we'll talk about number six, seven, and eight, a little bit about our homework. Number to raise your hand if you have a question during the presentation. And if you don't get a time during, you can always ask your question when we're all done, when each speaker is done. So let me share my screen with you guys. And make it bigger. It takes a second to load, sorry about that. Okay. Hmm. Our mom did this for Ella's, um, for my older sisters when she was in third grade, but she added another slide. Can right. everyone see the first slide, the title slide? Everybody see it? Okay. So, my name is Sarah Cohen. I think I've met a lot of you when I have visited your classroom, but at work, I'm known as Dr. Sarah Cohen, epidemiologist. 
And so today, what we're going to talk about is what does it mean to be an epidemiologist? Okay, so epidemiology is a really big word, but what it all it really means is it is how we study how often different diseases occur in different groups of people and why. So one way to think about an epidemiologist versus a doctor who also thinks about diseases is a doctor treats one person. You go to the doctor and you say, oh, I have a, a cough, and the doctor helps you figure out, oh, maybe you have strep throat. But an epidemiologist doesn't deal with just one person. We study a whole group of people. So you probably heard about epidemiology in action and you didn't even know it. So when you see a sign that says, did you wash your hands? Or when you go in the sun, you should wear sunscreen or be active and eat fruits and vegetables. People didn't just make those rules up. They learned about them by studying groups of people. And do you know who the people were who studied those groups of people? Epidemiologists. <laughs> Ms. Brown, you're on mute, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, so <clears throat> you might right now have heard a lot about epidemiologists if you've overheard the news because there's a disease outside that's keeping us all at home and not together called COVID-19. And epidemiologists are working really hard right now to study COVID-19 and help us learn about it. So some of the ways that we're doing that are we're making maps of where people who have COVID-19 live. We're writing computer code to help predict how many people might get it. We're studying the medicines that can help people get better faster if they have it. And we're sharing information about how to stay safe, including going back to washing hands is such a good way to keep diseases from spreading. I was on mute earlier. I was just reminding the kids any questions that they have, raise their hand and we can see the game. Yeah. Great. Okay. Next slide, please. Oops. Okay. So you yourself might want to be an epidemiologist if you like any of these things. If you like math, if you like science and biology, if you like computers or coding, if you like maps or if you're interested in human bodies. Those are all things that epidemiologists are interested in and use in our everyday work. So how did I get to be an epidemiologist? Well, I went to school for a lot of years. So I started at Carolina and I studied something called biostatistics, which is really just a lot of math. And then I went to the University of Michigan and I studied more biostatistics and it was very cold there, so I came back to North Carolina <laughs> where I studied epidemiology for five years at UNC. Next slide. And this is Dasha's little sister, if big anybody, sister. or big sister, sorry, if anybody knows Ella. This was Ella when I graduated with my PhD. <laughs> yeah, there's, that's my graduation, and then little tiny Ella, who's now in middle school. Okay, so where do epidemiologists work? Well, we work in lots of different places. We might work in the health department. We might work for the federal government in Washington, D.C. We might work for a place called National Institutes of Health, which is where we do lots of research. We might work in universities. And we might work in a private company, and that's what I do. <laughs> so what do I do all day here in this office that Dash jokes that I call my dungeon? You call it a dungeon. <laughs> I read about health. I collect data, I write computer code to help analyze that data, I make graphs to display what I've learned, and I write papers to share what I've learned. So a lot of those are skills that all of you are working on right now. You are learning to make graphs, you're learning to be good writers, you're learning about health. Those are all things that I still do every day in my job. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna talk, go back in history and do a little bit of a history lesson about epidemiology. So this is a guy named John Snow. <clears throat> and John Snow lived in London a long time ago when there were no indoor toilets. And sewage, which is what happens after you go to the bathroom, got dumped into the river or it got dumped on the street. And then people used wells and pumps to get their water for drinking, cooking, and washing. 
So something went terribly wrong. In 1854, there was a terrible outbreak of a disease called cholera in one little area of London. And people at the time thought that this disease might be carried in the air. They called it bad air. But Dr. Snow said he didn't think so. He thought it was water that was carrying the disease. So how did he prove this? He used epidemiology. Let's see how. So his hypothesis, or that's his idea, was that water from the Broad Street pump was causing people to get sick. So what he did was he asked people who got cholera where they got their water, and then he asked people who didn't get cholera where they got their water. And he made a map of it. So in the middle of this screen, there's a blue pump. Yep, and that's the Broad Street pump. And you can see all the red dots are where people got cholera. And then you can see on sort of the sides of the map, there's some other blue pumps. And these were other water pumps, not the Broad Street pump. And what you can see is there's not really as many sick people around those. So that made Dr. Snow think maybe he was onto something. And so he asked a lot of questions. So for example, he learned that people at the Soho coffee shop, they served water from the Broad Street pump. And that's where people who got cholera were going. There was also a factory that kept a tub of drinking water for workers that they got from the Broad Street Pump. They all got sick. And there was one lady who lived really far away from the Broad Street Pump, but she thought the water was so delicious that she had that water actually brought to her, and she got cholera. But he also noticed some other things. There was a prison that had its own well, and none of the people in that prison got cholera. There was also a brewery that made its drinks from water from their own well, and none of those people got cholera. So this is starting to be some evidence for his hypothesis, right? <clears throat> so in 1854, John Snow took his research to the people in charge of the town, like the mayor and the city council, and he convinced them to take the handle off of the Broad Street pump. And when they took the handle off, you know what happened? people stopped getting cholera. So if they weren't using the water from the Broad Street pump, they stopped getting sick. So what happened? Well, it turned out that a lady whose baby had cholera, she washed the diapers in water that she dumped right near the Broad Street pump and all that icky diaper yuckiness got into the water and that's how the Broad Street pump got contaminated. So this was what we consider to be the beginning of epi yeah, we're good, to be the beginning of epidemiology. <laughs> and so what he discovered helped make drinking water safer in London. And what we do now is still very similar to what Jon Snow does. We ask a question, we make a hypothesis or an idea, we collect some data, and then we share the results, which helps make people healthier. So epidemiology overall helps us lead healthier lives. So again, all these different examples that I showed of, of what we tell you about how to be healthy, a lot of that comes from research that epidemiologists do because what we really want to do ultimately is to help everybody lead a healthier life. Thanks friends for listening. Thank you so much for presenting. And does anyone have any questions for Mrs. Cohen? about what she likes about her job. Um, Rosie has a question. Um, yeah. Um, um, where did you work before you had this current job? And um, uh, yeah. That's a great question, Rosie. So I work for a, a little company that does epidemiology for lots of different other companies that have questions that we can help them answer. But before this, I was a professor, sort of, at Vanderbilt University, and I worked on a big study that the National Institutes of Health uh, paid for to help study health in the South. Do you have a question? <laughs> awesome question, Rosie. Any other questions for Mrs. Cohen about what she does or what she likes or dislikes about it? Mm, questions about where she went to school, anything? All right, we'll go ahead, even if you're muted, give Mrs. Cohen a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, friends. It was fun to talk with you. Thank you again.
And I believe Mrs. Todd, you will be next. So feel free to unmute yourself and I will get your presentation pulled up. All right, we have, all right, are we good to go, Ms. Todd? Yes, I see it. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. So, um, how are you? No, no, no. Hold on a second. Um, athletic trainer. So, I do not work in athletic training anymore, but I used to work um, at Duke as an athletic trainer. So, I'm not sure if everybody knows what an athletic trainer is. Does anybody know what that is? You've probably seen it, you just don't know the name. And you know. So what's an athletic trainer? Uh, athletic trainer is something who is, is a person who teaches about the energy. Inner, inner Inter, uh, yeah, okay, so athletic trainer is a person that helps with injuries. So it can work in a lot of different settings. So the definition of it is a healthcare professional who works with the physically active population. So this is a little bit different than physical therapy in that physical therapy can work with a bunch of different patients, not necessarily healthy patients, where, phys where athletic trainer deals more with the physical um, active population. So you will find us in hospitals and clinics, but you're, we're geared more towards um, the, you know, helping athletes return to play. So, and you're also a teacher. And so uh, what we need to know is we need to know how injuries happen. So the mechanism of injuries, how does an ankle sprain occur, how does an ACL sprain occur, things like that, concussions. You have to know how to treat those injuries. So when somebody does get an ankle sprain, can they go back to play? Do they have to go to the sideline? Do they need to see a doctor? Do they have to get surgery? Um, emergency care, meaning um, first aid, CPR. So if somebody goes down on the field and they're not getting up, you know, you have to know if they're breathing, conscious, things like that. And protective equipment, meaning can you just brace them up? Can you tape them? Um, helmets, all that kind of stuff. So you have to have knowledge in all those areas. Okay, so. No, I don't want to do that. Um, where can we work? So. It started out as the traditional setting was in colleges and universities. And still today, that's probably where you'll see the majority of the athletic trainers. Um, you see them in secondary schools, middle and high schools, um, clinics, hospitals, you'll see them on professional sports. So if you're ever watching um, college or professional sports on TV and you see somebody get hurt, especially in football, you see somebody get hurt, they're not coming up, then people run out to the field. That's the athletic trainer. So that's what my job is. Um, yeah. And then um, performing arts, so dance, circus olay, um, public safety, the military, and then occupational health. Okay. Um, why, did I, why did I enjoy this job? Um, I love science. So you have to know a lot about anatomy and physiology. And I really enjoyed that part of science, physics, things like that. Um, you have to be able to and work with people of all different ages. Mostly worked during my career with 18 to 22 year olds. So that's like not. Um, and he teaches classes. That's um, a hard population to work with just because they're not, they are adults, but they're not adults. So everything um, didn't necessarily have to go through their parents, but a lot of times the parents want to be involved because the kid is only 18, so. My mom's um, a teacher. Sports. Um, you have to like sports. If you don't like sports, you're probably not going to like the job because you're going to spend most of your time watching sports. Um, you're always learning, so it's you always learn something new. There's always new research coming out. There's always new data coming out that you need to apply to your practice. So that's, that's what I enjoyed a lot is that you always are continuing to learn something new. You're outside most of the day, especially if you have an outside sport, which I did. I had field hockey and women's tennis. Oopie. So I was outside um, majority of the day. And then another thing is travel. You get to travel to different places that you probably maybe would not have gone to before. Um, like Hawaii, we went to, you know, all these kind of places. So um, that was definitely a perk. My mom got me a red um, Accomplishment. So accomplishment. Um, you have accomplishments every day. So I would say every day was an accomplishment that you got somebody a little bit better. So you helped them um, go through their exercises. Now they can do a little bit more range of motion than they could before. 
they're going back to a little bit of practice and then maybe go back to the game. So the biggest accomplishment was, I guess, winning a national championship um, with just six healthy players the whole entire year. Um, we won the individual and the team championship, um, multiple ACC championships, final fours. Um, I also was an adjunct professor of sports injury at Duke, um, which I'm not doing that anymore either. Um, let's see, how do you go to the next slide? Okay. Challenges are um, very long hours. I mean, field hockey practice at seven in the morning. I had to be there at six and then tennis and practice till four. So you're there all day and um, you know, you're doing things all day. You're rehabbing um, injuries that the kids have to come in in between classes. You do their rehab, they go to class. Then they come back and do their second round of rehab before practice. Travel is also, um, it's good in the beginning and then once you start to have kids, the travel is a little bit hard to do. Um, I would be gone like, you know, days at a time. And so that's kind of a little bit of the reason that it's a little bit challenging. And then the most, well, the hardest thing I had to do was tell athletes their season or their career is over. And it's really hard to tell like a senior that their career or their um, season is over. And that's always hard to do. Um, why I think it's important, um, it's, it's an important job because you're helping athletes achieve their goal and to play at their highest level possible safely. And a lot of these athletes aren't gonna go pro, um, you know, but some of them are. So you're gonna help them achieve their professional career goals because some of them will go pro. Um, but mostly you're just helping them compete um, at their highest level. And some of those athletes aren't there do it as a job later on and a lot of times those kids are there um you know to play and get a good education and they wouldn't be at that school maybe if they didn't have sport as um in their lives so to play at your highest level safely is the most important part of why i think um athletic training the how so you have a four-year college degree mine was in biology um and then i at st joe's Joseph's in um, Philadelphia. And then I had a two year master's in sports health care at Arizona School of Health Sciences. I you have to do athletic training student levels um, all the way from up to, um, I have some professional experience as athletic training. Um, clinical rotations, you have to do so many clinical rotation hours with different doctors and clinics and surgeons. You take a national board certification. Um, and then you have to be licensed in your state and you have um, ongoing education that you have to complete every two years to keep your license and your certification. Um, I think that's all. That's it. I did have a picture in there. I guess it didn't come out. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Miss Brown. Miss Brown, you're on mute. Oh. Can you guys see the picture now? Um, so at Duke, they have a Hall of Fame room, and this was during the game, um, just to walk around and get some energy out. So <laughs> that was when he was little. But. So cute. And thank you so much for presenting. Who has questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why didn't you show a picture of me? Mm -hmm. I actually have a question. Oh. It would be, did you grow up playing sports and did that influence your career choice? Yeah, um, I have a twin sister and we have two older brothers. So we played sports all the time. Um, you know, you was always doing something, brother? something like that. And then, um, and then yeah. growing up, we um, just played sports, yeah, always went around with them and then, um, High school. I didn't play in college though, but I did student training in college. And once you're a certain level of a student trainer, you can do the team by yourself. So we did that. But yeah. Awesome. Valerie, you have a question. What 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 is your current job now? My current job job is a is a mom. Crest Cots. My current job so, is Crest Cots. So I can I do events every once in a while that, um, cause I still have my license and my certification. So I can do like um, club events, you know, if they're hiring and they need athletic trainers, um, I can do that. But I don't 
um, go to that type of thing every day. So yeah, Wait, tell me about your credit I worked at um, credit card. I did um, worked at a high school for a little bit, and then after grad school, I went. I worked at Duke, and then I ended at Duke. So, but yeah. So today I'm just at home. And she also has another job, which is credit card. Yeah. I have a question. This is <laughs> okay. this is Will Andrea's dad. Hi. For Andrew. Andrew, has your mom ever? Have you ever gotten injured, and your mom has ever helped you with your injury using her athletic trainer skills? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's funny you say oh. that because I'm I'm very hard on him. Like if he's like, oh, I'm tired or my leg hurts, I was like, you're fine. I was like, you're fine, just go. And then, um, but if with anybody else, I wouldn't be like that. But with my kids, I'm like, oh, it's it's fine, it's okay, you're fine. Like just go back out there. You're fine. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. But. I am wondering also um, whether this was in grade school or some of your very higher level math or math classes. Because mm -hmm. math and science, sometimes we get it and sometimes it can be very challenging. So did yeah. you ever have a class or a test that was very difficult for you and how did you overcome some of those learning challenges? She overcome um, them. I actually found math really hard. Um, I did a lot of like extra work, um, kind of like they, you know, not private tutoring, but the school would do some tutoring and things like that. And so I just worked extra hard and then um, eventually I got it. And even, you know, as I've released to athletic training, um, it's, you have to work hard because it's more of a um, male dominated profession. So you have My to keep on working and working and trying your best to kind of break that barrier. Um, to get the positions and stuff that you want. Um, so I think just now they have the first female athletic trainer in baseball just a couple years ago, and it's been around forever. So I just kept on working and pushing through it. Yeah, but I did find math really hard. It's not fan. Yeah, me too. But I like science. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing because I'm sure that encourages a lot of us that even if it's challenging right now, it doesn't mean. It's not a career path that we could choose. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions for Mrs. Todd? What her favorite thing about that job was, or any other questions? Thank you, lovely, so much. All right, round of applause for Mrs. Todd. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I will get Mrs. Edmonds' presentation ready. Share my screen. Right. Okay, just give me one second to make this full screen. All right, can you see it okay? I can. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. So I am uh, Jenny Edmonds and I'm Rosie's mom, and it's great to see everybody's face. And um, they've, we've already heard some great presentations, so I'm very excited to get to talk a little bit about where I work, which is the Environmental Protection Agency. And so um, I'm hoping that maybe somebody could tell me, um, if you raised your hand, if you could tell me what um, is something in the outdoor environment? Does anybody can tell me what environment means? Or Dashiell? Can well, environment just means like our earth, like it's just like the entire, I mean, like it's the balance of every living thing on our planet, which isn't always balanced. That's right. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. And um, I, so my job at the Environmental Protection Agency is, I, my whole job is to try and protect the environment and uh, public health. The, the things that um, Sarah Cohen was talking about with, with public health and epidemiology, my job is to try and make sure that pollution doesn't make people sick and doesn't make the earth sick. So I'm wondering if anybody can tell me what pollution is. Andrew? Pollution is like um like smoke and, and other stuff like in the air and water. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. So a, pol a pollution, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says it's any substance in the water 
or the soil or the air that uh, degrade that makes things in the environment worse. And it could be smelly, it could look bad, it could cause people to be sick, or it could even taste bad. And some and pollution makes the things around us less valuable. If it's really a lot of garbage around the trail, taking a hike isn't as much fun. Or um, sometimes if the water has a lot of pollution in it, you can't drink it and you can't swim in it. So all of those things are really important. And that's what the, the job of the Environmental Protection Agency is. And it's also called EPA, which is the acronym for that. Those, those letters stand for Environmental Protection Agency. And the, um, the EPA works for the whole country. And we even do help other countries to help protect the earth. And um, I, I, um, there, it's divided up into different parts of um, the way we can protect the earth, things we can protect the water, we can protect the land, and we can protect the air. And the part of EPA that I work in works on protecting people um, from air pollution. And overall, what EPA does, as it says on this slide, is that we work hard to share information about the earth and the environment. So there's a lot of um, data that we collect and share and put on our websites and put in brochures. Um, we also make sure that factories and cars and trucks and industries um, control the amount of, air, of pollution that goes into the air and the water and the land. And if people don't listen and they put a lot of pollution in, in the air, the water and the land, we make them clean it up. And we also do a lot of science research about the environment. And so, and why do we do it? Well, because our mission is to protect public health and the environment. So it's really cool to work for an organization where that's our job, like everyone. And there are about, I don't know, uh, 14,000 people across the whole country, everywhere from Alaska and Hawaii to here in North Carolina, up to Maine. We have people who are making sure that the environment is being protected. And um, EPA has been around for 50 years, which is almost as old as, it's actually a little bit older than uh, Rosie's dad. And uh, so we are celebrating this whole year our EPA's birthday, and um, that's very exciting. And we just, um, you, you may know that last week was Earth Day, and uh, so we celebrated that as well. And because of this, um, pandemic, this uh, we've we were going to have a lot of um, big events, but we've had to scale those back as well. So instead of having a stream cleanup, we had a lot of videos, just like you guys are having a lot of videos. So that was um, impacted Earth Day as well. So um, the kind of people who work at EPA, um, there are lots of different kinds of jobs at EPA. Um, there are lots of scientists, so those would be things like biologists and chemists and physicists. Um, so all of those sciences, lots of opportunities to work at EPA. Um, in addition to that, we have um, people who do a lot of computer work. You know, when you watch the weather, it will sometimes the weather forecaster will stand in front of a map and describe what the weather they think it's going to be like tomorrow or even the next week or, or even 10 days away. So those same kinds of computer models that they use to predict the weather are also really useful in figuring out things like how to reduce the amount of air pollution um, that, is, that is coming out into the world and where the air pollution is and how we can um, make sure that the people who are responsible for that are cleaning, cleaning it up. Um, we also uh, hire a lot of computer specialists to work on our websites and do mapping. Um, we have lots of people who do math, which would be um, statisticians who do lots of, of that kind of work. And then uh, for those people who, um, this point that we require polluters to clean up, well, what we do at EPA is all based in laws. And if people don't follow the rules and break the law, we have lots of lawyers who will help, will uh, take them to court and make them clean things up. Um, we also have um, people like librarians who help us organize our information. And we have lots of people who do research of different kinds. And we have people who do environmental education. And uh, for example, one of the women that I work with, she used to be a science teacher in middle school, and now she works for us helping to explain uh, the air pollution rules that we write. 
We also have um, people who were uh, used to, who got trained to be reporters because we need people who can write well. That's very important. And then there are people like me who are communicators. So um, my background is that I went to college and got a degree in uh, political science, which is basically studying government. And then I uh, went to graduate school at UNC and I got a master's degree in basically the same thing, something called public administration. So uh, that's how I got to be at EPA. And um, I think that the next slide is um, an example of some of the things that we communicate. So just like we have stoplight colors that are red, yellow, and green, uh, we have, uh, this is called the air quality index, and it helps people understand whether the air outside, what, 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 how is it? Is it good? Is it okay? Is it bad? And um, this is the dial that we use. It's called the air quality index. And you can get this on your phone. You can go to the website and check it out. And it's also in the newspaper and on a lot of uh, uh, TV uh, forecasts for the weather. The person who's doing the weather will often talk about the air quality for the next day. And um, you may have heard of this in the summertime, sometimes when it's really hot in here in Durham and uh, it, the air feels really sticky and you just feel it feels heavy. It might be because there are high levels of air pollution and smog in particular in the air. And so this, this dial would move from the green area into maybe a yellow or an orange or a red. And that would be, you would maybe change your behavior a little bit if the air quality outside is, is not good. For example, if you were, um, you were gonna go for a jog or your parents were gonna go for a jog, they might choose to do it early in the morning when the air is better than in the afternoon, like at three or four, oftentimes then in the summertime, it gets kind of sticky and hot and uh, high levels of, of yeah. smoke. So I'm, I think I'm gonna come talk to your class a little bit more about air quality um, next week, but that's what I'll give you a little preview now of what, I, what um, that's about. Because next week is Air Quality Awareness Week, which is a part of what my job is, is to share with teachers and students and, and the public about um, Air Quality Awareness Week. So everyone can make better decisions about, uh, about air pollution and your health. So happy to take questions. All right, who has questions? Dashiell. So um, what, like, if, say I wanted to be, uh, if I wanted to have your job, like, work at EPA, what kind of degree would I need to get in college? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think for my kind of job, you could have a lot of different degrees. If you had a science degree, that would be fabulous. If you got a journalism degree, and or a writing degree, that would also be great. Um, I help people in Congress explain, or people in Congress understand what we're doing about air pollution. And so my degree has a lot to do with government. How does government work? The, you know, the three branches of the government, they, they who can, mm -hmm. Ashel, do you know the three branches of government? Um, I believe I do. I thought you do. Can you share? Uh, executive, um, legislative and judicial. Very good, judicial, very good. Yeah, so I work in the executive part. And so understanding those different kinds of relationships between um, different parts of the government and the government people, all of that is, um, is helpful. But uh, EPA can use lots of different kinds of, of backgrounds. And uh, the people in my, the little group of people that I work in have very different degrees. Some of them are scientists. And as I said, one was a teacher, one is a reporter. Um, so, thanks. Nice. Anybody else have questions? Miss um, Cologne says in the chat box, do we have any statistics on how air pollution is doing in the Raleigh-Durham area since the outbreak of COVID? Have we seen anything better or worse with air quality? That is a great question, Ms. Cologne, and that is a question that reporters around the country are asking. How is this showing up? Is it getting better or worse? And I can say um, around the world, people are seeing much clearer skies. That's not universally true, but um, there was a story in the, in the newspaper about how um, an area in India 
had not been able to see the Himalaya mountains for 30 years. They just, it was too polluted, you just couldn't see it. And then for the first time because of this COVID-19, which is of course a, a terrible thing in and of itself, but one outcome of it is that uh, people are driving less and factories are working, are producing less pollution. And so they were able to see the Himalayas for the first time in 30 years. Now, there are also examples of where um, there might be increases in air pollution because of this. Um, a little bit like people, um, diesel trucks might be driving more because people are um, transporting stuff in different ways. But overall, what we're seeing is that generally across the country, levels are getting the air is cleaner than you would expect it to, say, example, a year ago of, at the same time. But um, we're still evaluating all of that data. Um, one thing that's interesting is that um, people sometimes have to go out to, there's something called a monitor that measures the amount of air pollution in the air. Mm -hmm. And if the, and the, sometimes you have to go out and someone has to physically go and change a filter or turn something on. And mm -hmm. some of those monitors, we just, people can't go do it. So we're getting a little bit less data in some circumstances because of people's just staying at home and they're not going out into the field to change those filters on the monitors. Would you say there is a challenge to working in your career sometimes? Yeah, there are a lot of challenges. Um, I think especially during this time, um, people are really busy and um, they, they can take the environment for granted or they have a lot of questions about how good the science is. And the science that we do is really good. And we work really hard at making sure that it's the best science for the American people, because that's who we work for. And we want to make sure that we're giving people great information. And sometimes that's hard. Um, but we, we're continuing to um, be committed, no matter what. Awesome. Well, are there any other questions, guys? All righty. Please give a nice big round of applause for Mrs. Edmonds and thank you for all that you do to keep our environment safe. Um, as I let you guys know at the beginning, after our presenters were finished, I did have, oh, let me get my screen ready. Um, I wanted to show you what your homework can be for this week. There's something you can do for writing about career day. And you can also continue with like Mrs. Edmonds said, learning about how to keep our earth safe and why we feel that clean air is important. All right, so now I can share my screen with you guys. And in writing, you can continue writing about the career that you are studying. And this time the questions will be why you would like to work in this career. Um, so if we, go to our work plan, you'll be able to see your homework. Let me actually maybe unmute you guys just so you can give me some feedback if you can see the screen that I'm showing. All right, so can we see the work plan? No. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So we're scrolling down our lovely little work we done plan. With that, and I noticed that this week it started with April 27th. So here's our ELA for this week. And today is Friday and we have two homework things, writing about our career and also a special I care about the clean air cloud. And you just click that link and you will see this cloud. Can everyone see the cloud? And if you don't want to print this, you can just go ahead and draw a cloud. And inside the cloud, Mrs. Edmonds, what sort of thing should we put? Uh, we, anything that you, why do you care about clean air? Maybe it's, maybe you have a brother or sister who have asthma, and that might be something that you care about clean air, because when the air is dirty, it makes asthma the air work. Is or maybe care about clean air because you loved going on a trip where you could look at the mountains like the Grand Canyon or even going to the beach. 
or maybe you care about clean air because you love to fly kites. Anything that why it, it is good for you and your health and your family and your, your community would be great. Awesome. Thank you. So if we can all finish this cloud by next Friday where we can talk more about Air Quality Awareness Week. Um, so again, your career day homework, if you're not quite sure what to write, um, you'll find it right here in your work plan. You can answer questions like why you think you might pick that career or what could be some good things about having that job or some hard things about that job. Uh -huh. um, last, before we go, Jackson has been working very hard at home and some others of you have been working very hard too, studying your careers and making a presentation on it. So um, Jackson, would you be okay sharing with us about a pizza shop career? Are you ready? Would you like Ms. Ms. Brown to help you? Yeah. All right. Maybe this can inspire us all if we're still choosing our careers or how we want to do our project. Jackson's presentation might give you some ideas of what to do. So Jackson, can you see your pizza shop picture? Yeah. Okay. Let's learn about Jackson's pizza shop. Okay. This is Jackson's awesome brain map. What would it be like to own a pizza shop? Well, well, she has it up here. See? Okay. All right. You want to see? You want to talk about the brain map? Yeah. Okay. So, pizza shop owners, they work hard by, what do they do? Work. Long, Long hours. Hours. Long yeah. hours. Yeah. And their job is to. You told me yesterday. You said they do what? They make the. They buy the supplies. Supplies. Uh huh. And they run the shop. Okay. And what kind of supplies do they buy? What did you tell me? You said cheese. yes, cheese and crust, crust and pepperoni and ovens. And pizza. Pizza what? Cookers. Cutters, yes. Pizza cutters and ovens. Yes, that's right. So where can they work? Yes. Where can pizza shop owners work? Worker, weaker. And weaker. Types of building, remember? Building. And sometimes fruit trucks. Fun, fun fact is that October is National What Month? Yes, Pizza Month. Um, Jackson. To open a pizza shop, what do you need to do? You need. Yes, you need recipes and a menu. What else do you need? You have to have a plan. Yeah. And then you told me you have to have a you have to have a building, so that's called also called a location. And what do we need? Lots of money. Money. Yes. And so the pizza shops can be what? Can you read it for me, please? They can be sit down. You said you wanted to do it. What? You need some help with Miss Brown? Okay. No. No. So you want to read it? Pizza shops can be. Jackson. Yes. Sit down. Delivery and takeout. Hello. Are you getting tired? No. Okay. All right. So you told me yesterday, or if you told me while we were working on this, that you want to own a pizza shop because people like pizza. Okay. And I want to make the biggest 
piece this, yeah. Okay. And what else? I want to make food for people. Very good. I love the pictures, Jackson. Was this pizza yummy? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> he was about 18 months old and he could chew. Oh. Yeah. Right. How do you get your pizza shop? We support. You need to what? What do we talk about? Well, what you need to do? Best and in school learn from my family. So we have an aunt who's a hater and a business. And then you can work and study at a pizza shop. At a pizza shop. And then what? Um, open. Open my own pizza shop. Very good, Jackson. Good job. Yes, yes. Yeah. Awesome, Jackson. Was that your last slide, bud? I think so. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Let's see if anyone has questions for Jackson, which by the way, guys, if you were confused, you don't have to have your project finished already, but some friends just got it all done in one. Um, but are there any questions for Jackson wanting to own a pizza shop? Miss Potts loves it, she says. Um, Andrea, a question. What inspired you to do a pizza pizza shop? <laughs> what inspired you two to do a pizza shop? Because what? You what? You, How do you feel about pizza? I like it. You like it. You don't just like it. You <laughs> love pizza. Yes. Yeah. Well, he made us so hungry. We're gonna have pizza. <laughs> Right, are there any other questions for Jackson? Yeah. All right, round of applause for Jackson. And then before you guys leave, like I'll ask you one final question and once you tell us an answer, you can leave the meeting. Um, and I'm just gonna go in order of who I see on my screen. So the question will be, what career sounds interesting to you? Sadly, you get to go first. I'm not sure. Maybe you just had to pick one to learn about, even if you don't want to choose it for yourself. I don't know if I want it yet. Mm -hmm. Firefighter? Firefighter. All right, Dashley, you're next. Well, the one that I was learning about would, was uh, basketball analysis because that combines two things I really like, basketball and math. So. Sweet. Ashley. I probably pay attention now. At the bottom of the screen says leave me and dash. <laughs> Ash, oh. career sounds interesting to you. Mm, oh, I want to be a baker. Oh, baker. I love that. Maybe cupcakes and stuff? Mm hmm Just like my mom. Awesome. And we know Jackson wants to own a pizza shop. And Andrew, what career sounds interesting to you? Inventor. Inventor? Yeah. Say yes. Yes. Wow. I hope you can invent things that'll help us be healthier and smarter. And that'll be great. <laughs> Alice, what career sounds interesting to you? Just now I have to go. Okay, George, what career is interesting to you? She asked you what career sounds interesting. Um, what career did we choose, Alice? Hi. Like, computer or, 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 or you can type it in the chat box. <laughs> um, let me know, Alice, if you think of one. Andrea, what career sounds interesting to you? I know. Okay, Alice, you first. Zookeeper. 
<laughs> a zookeeper. So neat. Andrea, or wait, no, I skipped Rosie. Rosie, your turn, then Andrea. <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, geneticists. Yes, I love your slides so far. Um, Andrea? I don't know yet because I have lots of things that I think would be interested, but. Can I say a couple? It's hmm. wonderful. What's just one? Um. A traveler? Mm, yeah, there are many jobs that would let you travel. So you're right, you have a lot of research to do. <laughs> what about Valerie? Um, I would be uh, a nurse, like my mom. Oh, a nurse. Well, I think that's everybody. So thank you, presenters, so much again, and everyone for coming. I'll try to upload this to YouTube if you ever want to watch it again, or if you didn't get to see it. Have a great day, guys. Bye bye. 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 Bye.